In module one, we introduced the idea that research studies begin with a general question about an entire population, but the actual research is conducted using a sample. In this situation, the role of inferential statistics is to use the sample data as the basis for answering questions about the population. To accomplish this goal, inferential procedures are typically built around the concept of probability. How can we make a connection between samples and populations? Suppose we had two cubes that were each filled with blue and red marbles. The first cube is 50 blue and 50 red marbles, while the second cube has 90 that are blue and only 10 that are red. Think of the cubes as populations and the marbles as potential samples to be selected. If you were to close your eyes and pick a marble from each cube, What's the probability that you would select a blue or a red marble? Although we cannot guarantee the exact outcome of your choice, it's possible to talk about the likely outcome in terms of probabilities. With the first cube you have a 50-50 chance of getting either colour. In other words, you're just as likely to pick a blue marble as a red one. For cube 2, the probability is 90-10, or put more simply, 9-1. It's nine times more likely that you pick a blue marble from this cube than a red one. Let's say we blindfolded you, randomly assigned one of the cubes, and allowed you to choose n of four marbles. Your task is to determine, based on your sample results, whether you've been given cube one or cube two. You choose your four marbles, one after the other, and they're all blue. Given your sample results, which cube would you conclude had been used? It should be clear that it would be relatively unlikely to obtain this sample from cube 1. The probability of this happening is low. In four draws you almost certainly would get at least one red marble. On the other hand, this sample would have a high probability of coming from cube 2, where nearly all the marbles are blue. Your decision therefore should have been that the sample probably came from cube 2. Notice that you now have used the sample to make an inference about the population. Probability concerns proportions and populations. By knowing the makeup of a population, we can determine the probability of obtaining specific samples. The cube 1 population had 50 blue marbles and 50 red marbles. The proportions were 50-50, so the probability was also 50-50. Whereas the cube 2 population had 90 blue marbles and 10 red marbles, so the proportions were 90 to 10, therefore the probability was also 90 to 10. Probability establishes a link between populations and samples. It allows us to predict which samples can be obtained given a certain population. Once we've established probability rules about the types of samples that likely would be obtained from a specific population, we can simply reverse those probability rules to allow us to move from samples back to populations. Let's talk through another way to illustrate this. A shark researcher has created an effective shark deterrent. It's an underwater beacon that gives off a sonic pulse humans can't hear, but that drives sharks away. As part of the developmental tests, he asked his assistant to deploy a beacon at one of two different beaches in Florida. However, the assistant loses his research notes and can't remember at which of the two beaches the beacon has been placed. To guess, he throws out a net of size n equals 6 and counts what is caught at both beaches. At beach A, the net catches one shark and five fish, while at beach B, the net catches two sharks and four fish. He then throws out bigger nets and counts what is caught at both beaches. With a net size of n equals 20, he catches two sharks and 18 fish at beach A, whereas at beach B, he catches eight sharks and 12 fish. Switching to a net size of n equals 100, he catches six sharks and 94 fish at beach A, whereas at beach B he catches 31 sharks and 69 fish. Given these sample results and the proportion of sharks to fish, 
It seems probable that the beacon was placed at Beach A, which has by far the fewest sharks. To sum up what we've said so far, probabilities used to predict what kind of samples are likely to be obtained from a population. Probability is to do with proportions and populations, and establishes a mathematical connection between samples and their populations. Inferential statistics rely on this connection when they use sample data as the basis for making conclusions about populations. Probability is a huge topic, and we won't attempt to examine it all here. Instead, we'll concentrate on the few concepts and definitions that are needed for an introduction to inferential statistics. For a situation in which several different outcomes are possible, the probability for any specific outcome happening is defined as a fraction or a proportion of all the possible outcomes. In other words, probability equals proportion of outcome. If the possible outcomes are identified as A, B, C, D, and so on, then the probability of A happening equals the number of outcomes that we class as A divided by the total number of outcomes. For example, if you're tossing a coin, there are two possible outcomes, heads or tails. The probability of getting heads is 1 in 2 because only one outcome qualifies as heads and there are two possible outcomes in total. The 1 in 2 or 50-50 probability can be expressed as a proportion, 0.5, or as a percentage, 50%. To simplify the discussion of probability, we use notation that eliminates a lot of the words. The probability of a specific outcome is expressed with a P for probability, followed by the specific outcome in parentheses. For example, the probability of selecting a king from a deck of cards is written as P brackets king. There are four outcomes that can be classed as king, in other words, there are four cards that can be identified as kings in a deck. The king of spades, the king of hearts, the king of clubs, and the king of diamonds. So the probability of selecting a king from the whole deck is 4 out of 52. Note that probability is defined as a proportion, or a part of the whole. This makes it possible to restate any probability problem as a proportion problem. For example, the probability problem, what is the probability of selecting a king from a deck of cards, can be restated as, what proportions of the whole deck consist of kings? In this situation, the whole deck of cards can be considered the population, and the single card we select is the sample. By convention, probability values are most often expressed as decimals. Here, 4 out of 52 is 0.0769 as a decimal, or 7.69% as a percentage. Any of these forms, fraction, decimal, percentage, is an acceptable way to express probability. You should also note that all the possible probability values are contained in a limited range. At one extreme, when an event never occurs, the probability is zero or 0%. At the other extreme, when an event always occurs, the probability is 1, or 100%. Thus, all probability values are contained in a range from 0 to 1, and they always have positive values. For our definition of probability to be accurate, it's necessary that the outcomes be obtained by a process called random sampling. A random sample requires that these two conditions must be met. First, each individual has an equal chance of being selected, and second, if more than one individual is selected, there must be constant probability for each selection. This requires sampling with replacement. Let me illustrate these two criteria with a deck of playing cards. First, the importance of each individual having an equal chance of being selected. Think of the deck of cards as the population and the single card is an individual being selected as part of a sample. The deck is shuffled and the goal is to try and select a king.
The chances of success are considerably different for the first selection than the second. It's obvious that the first attempt is not random because the cards are face up. However, the mathematical reason that it's not random is that the probabilities associated with each choice were not equal. The second criterion for a random sample requires sampling with replacement. Let's try again to select a king from the deck. We said earlier that the probability of success was 4 in 52. The first sampling results in a 4 of spades. Leaving that card to the side changes the probability of selecting a king from 4 in 52 to 4 in 51. The second sampling results in a 6 of clubs. Now the probability of choosing a king drops to 4 in 50. In order to maintain a constant probability for selection, the card that was drawn must be replaced back into the deck before the second sampling attempt. By doing this we have kept the probability at 4 in 52 for both samplings. Let's think of this another way. Say we want to select a sample of n equals 50 people from Connecticut by having a computer randomly choose a Connecticut cell phone number. We can't give preferential treatment to AT&T customers over those in Verizon or Sprint. That wouldn't be giving each individual an equal chance of being picked. And secondly, after someone has been chosen, the number needs to be replaced back into the population of numbers before we select a second person. We can't leave them to the side. They should have the same probability of being picked again as any other individual in the population. This is sampling with replacement. Having truly random samples minimises error and bias, but can be challenging to achieve. The situations in which we are concerned with probability usually will involve a population of scores that can be displayed as a frequency distribution graph. If the graph represents the entire population, then different portions of the graph represent different portions of the population. Probabilities equal proportions, so a particular portion of the graph corresponds to a particular probability in the population. The reverse is also true. The relationship between graphs and probabilities is demonstrated in example 3. For a simple population that contains only n of 10 scores, what's the probability that a random sample of n of 1 will have a score greater than 4? Using the definition of probability, there are two scores that meet this criterion out of the total group of 10 scores. So the answer would be 2 out of 10, which is a 1 in 5 probability, or 20%. If we were to answer this question by looking at the graph, the shaded part of the figure indicates the portion of the whole population that corresponds to a score greater than x equals 4. We're now defining probability as a proportion of area in the frequency distribution graph. This provides a very concrete and graphic way of representing probability. We introduced the normal distribution in module 2 as an example of a commonly occurring shape for population distributions. Statisticians often identify sections of a normal distribution by using z-scores. It's possible to describe the normal shape by the proportions of area contained in each section of the distribution. This figure shows a normal distribution with several sections marked in z-score units. The graph shows the percentage of scores that fall in each of these sections. For example, the section between the mean and a z-score of 1 contains 34.13% of the scores. 13.59% of the distribution scores are located between z-scores 1 and 2. 
2.28% fall between z-scores 2 and 3. The percentages shown apply to any normal distribution, regardless of the values for the mean and the standard deviation. The sections on the left of the distribution have exactly the same areas as the corresponding sections on the right side, because the normal distribution is symmetrical. Approximately 68% of the distribution falls within plus or minus one standard deviation of the mean. Approximately 95% falls within plus or minus two standard deviations of the mean, whereas 99.7% fall within three standard deviations of the mean. This figure sums up these three important proportions and the relationship to standard deviations of the mean. This allows us to solve problems like the following. Height has a normal distribution with a mean of 6 to 8 inches and a standard deviation of 6. If we select one person at random, what's the probability for selecting a person taller than 80 inches? Converting x equals 80 into a z-score we get a value of plus 2. The proportion of scores in the tail beyond z equals 2 is roughly 2.28%. This is the percentage of the human population who are taller than 6 foot 8. This graph shows proportion for only a few selected z-scores. A more complete listing of z-scores and proportions is provided in the unit normal table. This table lists proportions of the normal distribution for a full range of possible z-scores. The complete unit normal table is provided as a separate PDF. With the part that's reproduced here, notice that the table is structured into a four column format. The first column, A, lists z-score values corresponding to different positions in a normal distribution. If you imagine a vertical line drawn through a normal distribution, then the exact location of the line can be described by one of the z-score values listed in column A. You should also realise that a vertical line will separate the distribution into two sections, a larger section called the body and a smaller section called the tail. Columns B and C in the table identify the proportion of the distribution in each of these two sections. Column B presents the proportion in the body and column C presents the proportion in the tail. Lastly, the fourth column, column D, identifies the proportion of the distribution that is located between the mean and the z-score. To make full use of the unit normal table, there are a few facts to keep in mind. The body always corresponds to the larger part of the distribution, whether it's the right-hand side or the left-hand side. Similarly, the tail is always the smaller section, whether it's on the right or the left. Because the normal distribution is symmetrical, the proportions on the right-hand side are exactly the same as the corresponding proportions on the left-hand side. For example, the proportion in the right-hand tail beyond z equals plus 1 is exactly the same as the proportion in the left-hand tail beyond z equals minus 1. Note that the table does not list negative z-score values. To find proportions for negative z-scores, you must look up the corresponding proportion for the positive value of z. Although the z-score values change signs from positive to negative, from one side to the other, the proportions are always positive. Thus, column C in the table always lists the proportion in the tail, whether it's the right-hand tail or the left-hand tail. The unit normal table lists relationships between z-score locations and proportions in a normal distribution. For any z-score location, you can use the table to look up the corresponding proportions. Similarly, if you know the proportions, you can use the table to look up the specific z-score location. Because we have defined probability as equivalent to proportion, you can also use the unit normal table to look up probabilities for normal distributions. The following examples demonstrate a variety of different ways that the unit normal table can be used. Let's look at the step-by-step -step procedure with a generic example first. For a normal distribution with a mean of 500 and a standard deviation of 100, what's the probability of selecting an individual whose score is above 650? In other words, What's the proportion of the population with a score above 650? 
In order to solve this, you should first of all make a rough sketch and mark on it the mean and the standard deviation. Then locate and mark on your sketch the specific X score. Shade the appropriate proportion you're trying to find. Then transform the X value into a Z score. Then look up this Z score value for proportion in the unit normal table. Let's go through some specific examples from start to finish. Example 4. What proportion of the normal distribution corresponds to z score values greater than z equals plus 1? First of all, make a rough sketch and mark on it the mean and the standard deviation. Then mark on it the z score value that you're trying to find. In this case, z equals plus 1. Next, you should shade the proportion that you're trying to locate. The greater than wording in the problem means that the proportion we're trying to locate is to the right of the z score. Then looking up z equals 1 in column A of the unit normal table and reading the information in column C, the proportion is 0.1587 or 15.87%. Example 5. For a normal distribution, what's the probability of selecting a z score less than 0.15? So again, make a rough sketch, mark on it the mean and the standard deviation and then mark on it the z-score value that you're trying to locate. In this case, z equals 1.5. The less than wording in the problem means that the proportion you're going to shade and then look up is to the left of the z-score. So it's a body. Then looking up z equals 1.5 in column A of the unit normal table and reading the proportion information from column B, the answer is 0.9332 or 93.32%. Example 6. What proportion of the normal distribution is contained in the tail beyond z equals negative 0.5? Again, make a rough sketch and mark on the mean and the standard deviation, and then mark on it the z-score value that you're trying to locate. So in this case, z equals negative 0.5. The beyond wording in the problem means that the proportion you're going to shade and then locate in the table is located in the left tail beyond z equals negative 0.5. The proportion in the left tail beyond z equals negative 0.5 is identical to the proportion in the right hand tail beyond z equals plus 0.5. So to find the proportion, look up z equals 0.5 in column A and then find the proportion information in column C. The answer is 0.3085, or 30.85%. Example 7. For a normal distribution, what z-score separates the top 10% from the remainder of the distribution? Again, start by making a rough sketch. To find this z-score value, you need to locate 10%. 10% as a decimal is 0.1, which you can look up in column C of the unit normal table. Alternatively, you could look up 90% or 0.9, which was going to be in column B because it represents a body. You probably won't find the exact proportion you're looking for, but you can use the closest value listed in the table. In our case, 0.1003. Reading across from this to the corresponding z-score value in column A, you find the answer. The z-score value that separates the top 10% is z equals plus 1.28. Example 8. For a normal distribution, what are the z-score values that separate the middle 60% of the distribution from the rest of the scores? Again, start by making a sketch. To find these z-score values, we begin with the known proportions, which is 60% in the centre and 40% divided equally between the two tails. 60% as a decimal is 0 0.6. The 0 0.6 in the centre can be divided in half, with exactly 0 0.3 to the right and the left of the mean. Looking in column D for a value of 0 0.3, you'll see that the exact proportion is not in the table, but the closest value is 0 0.2995. Then read across the row to column A, and you should find a z-score value of z equals 0 0.84. Our answer is plus 0 0.84, 
and minus 0 0.84. These are the z-score values that separate the middle 60% of a distribution from the rest of the scores.